Good morning. My name is Danae Doris, and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Mr. Scott Lane, joining us today for his webinar entitled, Sustainable Design, Net Zero Middle School. Mr. Lane serves as the Assistant Superintendent for School Support Services for the Irving Independent School District located in Irving, Texas. While Mr. Lane's responsibilities are diverse, he has been instrumental in the design and construction of what is believed to be the first net zero middle school and the largest net zero public school in the country. Mr. Lane's additional duties include maintenance, environmental compliance, security, energy management, and school construction. Thank you, Mr. Lane, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Sustainable Design, Net Zero Middle School. I appreciate your interest in this topic today and of our recent design and construction of Lady Bird Middle School. This presentation will take approximately 30 to 45 minutes, and we will have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. To give you a little bit more on, on my background, um, my degree is in architecture from the University of Illinois, but I have spent the last 30 years in education in the state of Texas. Uh, provide educational perspective, uh, by no means am I an expert on sustainability design or the net zero concept in general, but I will share with you my experience over the past couple of years in the design of this school. Hopefully this will be useful information and assist you in your future endeavors relative to sustainable planning, design, and construction. Whether you're an architect, an engineer, consultant, educator, or student, most of this information I will present today should be very useful. So let's begin. When we talk about the history or the relevance of sustainability, it's difficult to, to really ascertain when the topic first came to life. So uh, I'll try to apply a little bit of perspective uh, to this topic. As you can see uh, from this uh, information on the screen, sustainability really isn't a new idea. For almost 100 years, scientists, noted authors, politicians, ed and educators have talked about sustainability, even though the word wasn't available to them at this time. At these quotes, I put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. That was actually said by Thomas Edison back in 1931. So you can see uh, he was a, a pioneer in the solar uh, power industry even back then. The second quote, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Now, that one doesn't necessarily apply to just sustainability, but, but I think to life in general, and uh, that was quoted by Albert Einstein. And then the third quote, which is, uh, we are obligated to leave the country looking as good, if not better, than when we found it, was actually quoted by Lady Bird Johnson, uh, the name of our new school. And late, as many of you should know, Lady Bird Johnson was the wife of our 36th president. Uh, the school we will talk about today, uh, was aptly named after her because of her influence in the field of education. Uh, she was a very big part of the federally funded Head Start program that began back in the 60s. What is sustainability? Uh, as I said, we're going to talk about uh, sustainability and net zero. First, uh, su sustainability. There, there are many variations uh, to the net definitions as noted here. Probably the most popular was uh, said at the 1987 United Nations Conference, uh, defines sustainable developments as those that meet present needs without compromising the ability 
for future uh, future generations to meet their needs. Sustainable means using methods, systems, and materials that won't deplete resources or harm natural uh, cycles. Uh, and certainly e uh, electricity, the way electricity is made, uh, it, it certainly does uh, harm and deplete our natural resources. Sustainability identifies a concept and attitude in development that looks at a site's natural land. In our case, the geothermal was used, the water, uh, as far as rainwater retention and uh, uh, water storage that we've used on this project, and energy resources such as sun and wind, which uh, I will share with you in a little more detail. Sustainability also integrates natural systems with human patterns and celebrates continuity, uniqueness, and placemaking. If you look at this slide, when we talk about sustainability, we really need to discuss the relevance or the need for this type of design. In this particular slide, you can see the applicable percentages relative to power and emissions that are attributed to buildings throughout the United States. In terms of sustainability, approximately 40%, as you can see here, 40% of raw materials used and even 38% of carbon dioxide emissions can be attributed to buildings throughout the United States. All of this contributes to our environmental issues associated with greenhouse gas emissions. In terms of energy consumption, 72% of the electrical consumption in this country comes from buildings. Uh, to put this in perspective with educational facilities, the nation has uh, 17,450 K through 12 school districts that spend more than $6 billion annually on energy, more than it is spent on computers and textbooks combined. As much as 30% of a district's total energy use is, uh, deals with inefficiency and is used unnecessarily. This wasted money can be used uh, for other more important things, either to reduce budget expenditures or even turn around and put that money back into instructional programs. By being more energy efficient, schools can prevent greenhouse gas emissions and improve the student's learning environment. School districts can and have also used the savings from improved energy performance to help pay for building improvements and other upgrades that enhance learning environments. When you look at uh, sustainability and what a big issue it is in our country, uh, I think it comes to light by looking at the current president's uh, initiative for energy conservation and sustainability. Uh, president Obama, uh, in concert with Vice President Biden, came up with the Obama-Biden Comprehensive New Energy for America Plan. And this covers several topics. First, the creation of jobs. Uh, this particular plan will help to create over 5 million new jobs by strategically investing over $150 billion over the next 10 years to catalyze private efforts to build a clean energy future. Within 10 years, uh, we hope to save more oil than we currently import from the Middle East and Venezuela. In terms of plug-in hybrid cars, the plan calls for putting over 1 million plug-in hybrid cars in place, cars that can obtain up to 150 miles per gallon on the road by 2015, cars that we will work to make sure are built in the United States. In terms of electricity through renewable energy sources, uh, the plan calls for us ensuring that 10% of our electricity comes from renewable sources by 2012 and 25% by 2025. In terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we hope to implement an economy-wide cap-and-trade program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by the year 2050. When you talk about net zero, uh, it, it's really more or less just an extension of sustainability in general. Uh, to define net zero, uh, if you look at this graphic, the important thing about net zero when we talk about it is that it's a two-part process and that uh, buildings have to be designed as efficiently as they can be up front. 
and then renewable energy such as sun, wind, and geothermal is then added to the design process in order to create a net zero concept. In very simple terms, if you're not familiar with net zero, uh, simply what that means is we will produce as much energy on the site as what the building needs to consume in order to operate. So thinking about that, if you think of a school that's, that's not built very efficiently, it would take uh, more renewable energy sources, more equipment to produce e renewable energy sources on the site to, to get to the grid neutral or net zero concept. So it, it's extremely important, and I'll show you throughout this webinar some of the things we did to create a more efficient uh, construction process up front that allowed us to get to the net zero concept. So I always like to pose these questions and uh, it's simply what if a school could be designed and built to produce as much energy on site as it consumes from the electric grid. There would be none, none or very minimal electricity build for use of air conditioning, lighting, or power there would be limited or no gas bills related to heating, hot water, or food preparation, and there would be no water bills for ground irrigation. Five years ago, uh, this was pretty much impossible, and not because the technology wasn't there, but because of the costs associated with developing renewable energies. And over the past five years, technology has increased to such a significant level, it makes this a, a very realistic opportunity because it is, it is certainly more cost effective now to look at renewable energy sources in, within buildings. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, this school was named after her and she was an environmentalist as, as well as uh, very involved in the educational process. Uh, to give you some general information as, as I go through this webinar about Lady Bird Middle School, it is 152,000 square feet. It resides on 23 acres of land. It is located in an area of town that is mostly industrial, but does have some multifamily housing adjacent to it. It is designed to accommodate up to 1,000 students, grades 6 through 8. It just opened this past August and currently has about 950 students. It is drawn to accommodate the design capacity for this school. Three of our existing seven uh, middle schools had enrollment that exceeded 1,200 students. Our goal within the district is to reduce capacities at all of our middle schools to approximately eight, 850 to 950 students. When boundaries were established, uh, projections indicated about 850 students would attend this school. Since we're at 950 students and have very little uh, student growth within our district, uh, this indicates that families moved into the boundary area in order to attend this school. Uh, we currently have, uh, as I said, 950 students at the school and we have over 100 students on a waiting list to be able to go to this school. It has received quite a bit of recognition, uh, not only throughout the country, but within our community. And people and parents and students are very excited about possibly attending this school. As was mentioned on the introduction, uh, this is, as far as we know, to the best of our knowledge, the first net zero public school in the state of Texas. It is the first net zero middle school in the country and it is the largest, as far as we know, the largest net zero public school in the country. I like this slide, and, and when I do this presentation, I show this a lot, but the, our Chamber of Commerce within the city of Irving really likes slides or anything about the community that says we're first in anything. And the Chamber of Commerce has been a very big proponent of the school. Uh, we have also seen groups come from all over to visualize and realize uh, what this school actually does and we're actually I'll show you a little bit later but we're actually selling sponsorships for, for vendors and large corporations to be a part of this school with us. One of the questions I get quite often is you know a net zero school it's a new thing um, it's a great thing and uh, number one why wouldn't you do this all the time but uh, also 
why wouldn't you do it to existing schools rather than just new schools? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, the problem with existing schools is that they are, they are built very inefficiently. The older they are, the more inefficient they were built. So if they were inefficient to begin with, obviously they use more energy. And in order to achieve a net zero concept, uh, that would result in us having to add more renewable energy uh, equipment to the site. So it really becomes cost prohibitive to do uh, this type of project as a retrofit to existing schools. When you talk about the initial design process, uh, as you can see from this slide, in, in Texas, the average BTUs per square foot per year of a typical middle school is 56,000 BTUs. Within the Irving School District, uh, our middle schools average about 50,000 BTUs per square foot per year. This school was actually designed up front at a, a very high efficiency level, and the, the energy model indicates that it will only consume about 23,000 BTUs per square foot per year. So what that means is that we have to provide enough equipment for renewable energy to meet 23,000 BTUs per square foot per year rather than the 56,000, which would be cost prohibitive. So the next question that comes up with is, well, if this is such a great thing, why don't more school districts or, or companies uh, do this type of construction, the net zero concept? Well, basically, it comes down to what, what I would say is one major issue, and that is cost. And what you can see from this particular slide is the additional monies we had to spend in order to achieve the net zero concept. Uh, in total, uh, the school, if it would have been built like a typical middle school, would have cost us about $168 per square foot. However, with the renewable energies and, and other things that we did within the building, it added approximately $25 per square foot to the overall cost of the building. Uh, this equates to about a 10 to 15 percent increase in building costs. So uh, you, you have to look at the pros and cons on, and whether you have the financial resources to put a school like this in place. But if you look at this slide, the majority of the costs, uh, additional costs, are related to the solar panels. Uh, it's approximately 550 to 600 kW array and uh, costs us about $3 million or almost $20 a square foot. What's interesting to note about the solar panels is when we started the design process uh, six months prior uh, to the bids coming in, the estimated costs for the solar panels were approximately $3.5 million. So within a six-month period, we actually saw a substantial decrease in, in the cost of the solar panels. And this, again, is due to the changing, changing technologies in that type of product. Uh, many of the things that we did here were, were more related to sustainability than they were to the net zero concept. And I will cover some of these uh, as we go through the design. In terms of payback, when you look at the three point 3.5 million dollars uh, additional money uh, that we had to spend. Here is information on payback period based on uh, what we had to spend. As you look at this information, the uh, base building HVAC or a four pipe system, the purple line, shows the initial cost at zero because that of course is your initial investment, that being a part of the normal cost of a building. And you can see over the, the course of the life of that equipment, um, the costs, uh, we spend about $6 million in utility costs for a four-pipe system. Well, if you look at the geothermal design, which I'll talk about in a little bit, the geothermal design is a, a much more highly efficient design. And over the course of its lifespan, uh, costs associated with it are approximately $4 million. But then you add in some of the renewables and you start to see what the paybacks look like. The blue line indicating just a solar panel application with the um, 
beginning of it being about a $3 million investment. And you can see over the course of the building, the solar panels would pay out in about a 21-year uh, period. Um, questions always come up on what is the life expectancy of solar panels. I'm not sure anyone knows because they're, they're relatively new. Uh, I know the ones that we've put in the site uh, are expected to last 20 to possibly 25 years. But what costs us uh, $3 million today, who knows what that will cost in 20 years. Uh, it may be $3,000 by that time. And then the, the net zero concept, you'll see the initial costs are approximately the same, a little bit more. But because of the efficient design and other things we did uh, with the solar, the geo, the wind, uh, our payback is estimated at between 12 and 13 years. Um, we feel like this is probably a conservative number. Uh, based on uh, the early data we have gotten since the school opens up, but uh, we hope that the school will pay for itself within a 10-year period. In terms of money, this is uh, part of the energy model that was constructed uh, before the school was built. Um, it was important to us, and it's important to everyone, that we just don't say we're going to build a net zero school and assume it's going to be net zero because we've put enough solar panels in there to office, offset uh, the consumption levels. Uh, as, as I mentioned, there was an energy model done to determine whether or not, uh, at least on paper and in design, we could achieve the net zero concept. And if you look at this slide, uh, it estimates the total KWH that will be consumed for this particular school. This number looks relatively low, but bear in mind, the school was designed at a very high efficiency level, so it's not going to consume as much power as what a typical middle school would do. The costs associated with that uh, shows our electricity to be at about $67,000. And then we project that the solar panels will produce about 878,000 kilowatt hours per year. So if you could equate this to uh, into buying and selling, which you really can't do, but just for simple purposes, to equate it into buying and selling, it looks like we would be able to sell approximately 267,000 kilowatt hours uh, back to the electric company uh, as a part of this school, which uh, equates to about $17,000 annually. Now, the way net zero works is uh, on a typical day, uh, let's say when we started school, we utilize all the power we can possibly produce on the site through the solar and the wind. And that power is used first to meet the, the building load, meet the needs of that particular building. However, in August in Texas, it's extremely hot. Uh, you're adding almost a thousand kids to the site, and uh, it's very difficult to be able to produce enough power to meet the building needs at that time. So we, during the day, we produce as much as we can, but then we pull power from the electric grid to meet our needs. But then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun goes, or the kids go home, the air conditioning shuts off at the site, and uh, air conditioning sh shuts off at the site. However, the sun is still out for three or four more hours, and the wind is still blowing and producing power. Well, we make more power than what we need uh, to service the building at that time. So uh, during that time, we actually sell that additional power back on the electric grid. We actually don't sell it. It's, it's handled as a credit to our existing account. So over the course of the year, our intent is we will send back as much as we need to hit the high peak load periods of the year. So over the course of the year, there is a net zero consumption level at the site. I'm careful to say it's a net zero consumption and not necessarily a net zero cost because what happens is that when you purchase electricity, 
a portion of your bill the, or the costs associated with kilowatt hour is based on the commodity charge and then a portion is based on the transmission charge as well. In our case we pay about nine cents per kWh uh, for our electricity, six cents is for the commodity, the electricity, and three cents is for the transmission charge. The transmission charge mainly deals with the costs associated with sending that power over the grid to our site. So when we send power back, it, it makes a lot of sense. When we send power back, you cannot expect the uh, electric company to pay us to send the power on their grid. So what we send back, we are credited at a six cent per kWh rather than the nine cents we're paying. So uh, that's why I say uh, it's, it's a net zero consumption and not necessarily a net zero cost. To put the previous chart in, in a more graphic form, you can see on, on this slide the red represents the total en energy consumption that's projected throughout the year at each month and then the uh, green graph behind is what we're anticipating we will produce throughout the year with the solar and the wind. You can see in September uh, what we will actually be purchasing would be the difference between these two graphs and it, it appears that we will be purchasing power pretty much through the entire year. However, in the summertime, when we get to June and July and even August, our, our power uh, needs for that particular building go way down because we don't utilize our buildings in the summertime. For the most part, they're shut down. We do provide some air conditioning to control humidity levels, but for the most part, the buildings are shut down and we'll produce a tremendous amount of power on site at that time and in order to offset what we've had to buy from the power grid throughout the year. We've actually, this was the model, we've actually seen better numbers than this uh, in the first month of the school. Another reason we talk about net zero and the advantages to it, uh, one of them deals with budgets. And I don't know uh, how things are in other parts of the country, but I, knew, I do know Texas is going through uh, a very difficult time in terms of funding for education. We had significant cuts this year at the state level uh, to our educational funding and which has caused us to make many many budget reductions uh, throughout the year. But if you think about it, this is one area where uh, just, just like energy conservation, this is one area where we can actually save money and put that money back into the instructional program. And relative to this building, uh, the initial expense, which was an additional three to four million dollars, we utilized a portion of our bond funds to, to fund that additional expense. However, the utility budget uh, is a part of the general operating fund, and it comes out of uh, funds associated with the normal budget and, and not bond, bond funds. It comes out of maintenance and operations uh, funding. So when you make this initial investment, you're able to reduce the amount of money needed in your utility budget for this particular school. Typically, uh, we would budget approximately $250,000 for a middle school uh, in Texas and in, in the Irving School District. And we are anticipating a cost of about sixty to seventy-five thousand dollars for the school. Again, I'll say we're we're achieving net zero in terms of consumption, but not necessarily in costs. And a, a a big portion of what we did have to budget is associated with uh, costs for uh, water and sewer needs within the building. In terms of uh, design strategies, uh, I will go through these and uh, give you some idea of of what we did in terms of uh, design for this building. Again, I'll bring up the point that it's, it's extremely important that you reduce initial consumption in order to be able to achieve a net zero concept. 
the, these are some of the things we've done. Uh, a lot of them just deal with sustainability, and, and some will deal with net zero concept. But, uh, and, and I'm going to go into these in more detail, but the rainwater collection and gray water harvesting, energy star rated kitchen, uh, all the equipment in the kitchen, the geothermal heating and air conditioning system, laptop computers, wireless laptop network, computer. and the whole holistic monitoring of energy use throughout the building. In terms of gray water and rainwater, a uh, couple of things we did within the building. We capture all of the rainwater and, and pipe it to an underground storage tank. We also uh, capture all of the condensate water from the air conditioning system and, and put that in the tank. We also uh, recapture or capture water that's utilized in the athletic area, what we call gray water, uh, water that has been used for showers and for the washers. Uh, this water is also recaptured and stored in the storage tank. We use all of this water uh, for uh, irrigation on the site, drip, uh, mainly drip irrigation uh, for the landscaping because it's important that when you use gray water, at least we've been told by engineers that uh, gray water uh, does not need to be sprayed uh, through a, an irrigation nozzle. It, it needs to uh, not enter into the air. So we, we strictly use this type of water uh, for drip irrigation on our landscaping. And then we also have a, a water well on site that's 1,900 feet deep. And it is used to irrigate all of the lawns and athletic fields at the site. So we use no water from the city to meet our needs in terms of uh, irrigation for landscaping and, and lawns. This particular slide, uh, I've tried to pull out some photos, recent photos that we've taken. This is the area in the back of the building that is for our class, and the storage tank is actually located underneath the plaza uh, for the art class. And the data is, is fed into the building to where we can monitor the various levels uh, of the water in the tank and what, what their source of water is, whether it's gray water or rainwater uh, from the roof or condensate. We've also included uh, on this building uh, a sundial that you see uh, to the left. It's an eight-foot stylus that is it's positioned uh, above a 20-foot diameter plaza, and the kids use this uh, for uh, class. It's an outdoor class, and it's also a staging area for the kids uh, uh, waiting on buses. Uh, it's, it's made of uh, stainless steel uh, because of its durability and aesthetics to the site. Within the building, the main corridor, uh, you can see the uh, mural that we had uh, placed on the wall. And you'll see as we go through this, the whole concept of the school is, is to get kids involved in energy conservation, uh, renewable energy sources, and to keep them conscious of this throughout the day. So as they walk down the main hallway, you will see the evolution or history of power associated uh, with our country, starting off with the coal and turning to the oil pumps, the nuclear energy, um, and then the solar, and then uh, a rough uh, photograph of our building. In the kitchen area, uh, I talked earlier about the Energy Star Rated Kitchen Equipment. This particular kitchen is considered 100% recyclable. And as far as we know, it, it's the, the first one uh, there is. Uh, all of the trays, the plates, the utensils, the cups, everything is made uh, uh, with recycled material and is 100% recyclable. The countertops are made from recycled glass, and you can also see the recycling centers uh, that we have throughout the building. This machine is called a pulper, and it is new to our district. I know there, there are several throughout the state of Texas, but it's basically uh, more or less a compost machine. And the way it operates is that instead of the kids throwing their plates and trays and everything into a garbage can, uh, even though it's recycl recyclable, um, they throw it into the pulper. Uh, there's a chute on the other end, and the pulper actually 
uh, churns. Uh, it's full of water and blades, and it churns everything, including the paper products and the food. And uh, it comes out at the other end uh, and, and goes into a dumpster, but it the amount of waste is 10% of what it would be uh, for uh, normal throwaway. So, and, and the big advantage to this also is that the uh, material that comes out can also be used for composting. Even though we're not doing that yet, that is our plan in the future. The heat pump technology that we use throughout the building, uh, heat pumps, uh, pretty, pretty simple concept in that wells are drilled uh, into the ground uh, and you circulate water uh, through the ground and, and use the constant temperature of the earth uh, for heating and cooling of the water to meet the, the needs of, of the building. The, the way heat pumps work is your ground temperature is, is constant at about, once you reach a 12 foot depth into the ground, the temperature remains the same year round. So we actually have 530 wells uh, over 250 feet deep that are used to heat and cool the building. Some pictures of the geothermal system. You can see it's on display in the hallway where kids can learn about the geothermal system. It, it's also one of the uh, heat pump units is exposed in the ceiling so uh, the children can come by and learn about the heat pump and how that works. Uh, the gauges that you see here are actually located in one of our large demonstration rooms behind these doors. And again, this is uh, for kids uh, to be able to learn about geothermal and how it works. There's also uh, energy uh, recovery ventilators that are used throughout the building uh, that allows us to uh, filter or temper uh, the amount of outside air that comes into the building, and it's tempered by the use of the return air uh, through, through the use of heat exchangers. And then we talk about networking throughout the building. Uh, laptops, netbooks, and iPads are the main use. Uh, kids have them in every class. The building's completely wireless. Uh, we tried to, to save on uh, wiring and trying to cut back on our uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with wiring and our costs. Uh, very minimal because of the wireless networks, the electrical outlets are, are at a minimum uh, in accordance with building code. In terms of uh, the building envelope, we did several things. Increase the wall and roof insulation, uh, dual pane high efficiency glazing, uh, solar shading, daylighting in classrooms, and light harvesting. These are very old, very simple passive solar techniques uh, that were used throughout this building in order to uh, shade the high summer angle in the summertime. Uh, the overhangs uh, prohibit the sun from entering the space, and then the lower angle in the winter allows the sun to enter the space to help heat. Here you can get a good idea of the overhangs uh, that are used. This is a western exposure on this end, and you can see the shading that takes place uh, in particular classrooms. Daylight harvesting is also used throughout um, daylight harvesting uh, is advantageous in that the shelving, uh, daylight shelving allows us to uh, take the sunlight and bounce it off the ceiling, provide additional lighting for the space, and then all of the interior lighting is, is based on a, a photo sensor or photo vague cell that will dim the lights in the classrooms to compensate for the amount of sunlight that enters the space. This gives you an example of the daylight shelving that's uh, resident in the cafeteria area. The first floor, the main corridor for our building, uh, the arrows will tell you there uh, which way you are looking, but uh, you look at the clear stories in, in the main corridor and just a tremendous amount of light uh, that comes in uh, through the clear stories. And then uh, that is pretty much how we reduce uh, energy within the building. And then the two things we do in order to produce energy, uh, obviously, is the solar and, and the wind. Uh, when we look at the solar, uh, three, three foot by five foot panels all along the roof of uh, 550 to 600 kW array 
uh, over 65,000 square feet of solar panels have been placed on the roof. And these particular panels, as you can see, uh, uh, it's, it's a rotted type panel. They're not uh, solid glass panels. It allows the sun to, to go through and reflect off the roof. Uh, maximum efficiency, 191 watts per panel. And it also helps us to deal with uh, wind loads uh, that occur in Texas. Gives you a good idea of the solar panels on the roof with a platform that allows the kids to come out and view the solar panels and then the earth inverters uh, located in the hallway. Again, the kids can come up and view the inverter panels as well. In terms of the wind turbine, there are 12 wind turbines on site. These are more of a residential variety uh, due to the noise restrictions uh, of our area uh, from the city of Irving. Uh, however, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, we're in an industrial area, so this really hasn't been an issue. But very little power is produced from the wind turbines, uh, they're more of a landmark for the site and an educational tool for the kids. In terms of energy use, uh, you can see the geothermal results in about 30% savings in energy for the building. Uh, high efficiency boilers, hot water heating, energy star rated kitchen equipment reduces the energy and gas consumption by about 9%. The lighting techniques uh, associates for 6%, and there's the 4% 4, 4 reduction in miscellaneous loads such as uh, the power restrictions, wireless networks, and the building sweeps that occur. And then 41% of our power production comes from the solar panels. In terms of the, uh, the building itself, as you can see, there are, are learning nodes associated throughout the building. There are four nodes. Uh, there's an Omni room that was placed up front, and this room was designed to accommodate about 75 students. And our thought is uh, not to restrict use of this building to the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders that go there, but allow it for use by all of our students throughout the district. So kids will, will actually come over on a bus, go into this room, learn about the various renewable energies, and then go to different areas in the building and observe the uses of that type of energy within the notes. And I'll show you those very quickly. Here's one of the nodes. Uh, there are four nodes, uh, earth, wind, sun, and, and water. And it gives you an idea. Uh, they're all interactive, and they teach kids about the various aspects of renewable energies and it's just a great learning tool for the science. This particular node is, is the wind turbine, the sun, and when we started off, it was interesting, uh, we started off calling this solar, but you can do so much more in terms of science when you talk about sun and not restrict yourself to just solar applications. And then the final one is water. A typical classroom, you can see the amount of lighting, we, uh, daylighting we have in the classrooms. Uh, lights being off, uh, had to go with short throw projectors because of the amount of light uh, that comes in uh, through the windows. The hallways, uh, LED fixtures throughout, and you can see the amount of light we're getting through the classrooms in order to light these hallways. And then uh, touch on three things real quick when you talk about the environment and global warming. This is a reason you do a project like this. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, how much they've gone up uh, over the last 20 years, and, and the amount of uh, electricity, energy, uh, that is used in buildings and how much of that produces emissions. And then the net zero concept helps to, re to reverse that negative trend. So the environment is one great reason to do a project like this. Another reason is the economy. If, if you look at the amount of money uh, we spend overseas for various things, not, not just oil, but other things associated with uh, energy, um, you know, if there was a way to uh, possibly try and improve uh, our own economy by doing things within our country, 
I think it would be a tremendous boon uh, to the United States. And then third is education. Uh, you know, we may think, you know, kids, uh, you know, we may not be around and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, things like that may not be a big issue in our lifetime, but it probably will be for our kids and for our grandkids. So rather than dismiss that thought, we need to do our part and ensure that uh, we do what we can to educate uh, future generations on the need for sustainability and, and renewable energy concepts. I'd like to finish uh, with a short video uh, that will show you what took place on our opening day, and then we'll open it up for questions. Students in Irving ISD get a couple extra days to sleep in. Classes there don't start until Wednesday, but as the 33's Tommy Noel found out, some middle school students were wishing classes did start today. He takes you to the first net zero school in Texas. Some students dread going back to school, but youth at Lady Bird Johnson have been counting down to their exciting first day. Normally I wouldn't be, but this school is just amazing, and I, I just want to be back at school because of this. This school is special, and everyone here knows why. The first net zero school in the state of Texas. It's completely net zero. World's largest net zero school in the, in the in America. While everyone agrees on why it's so special, I got a wide variety of definitions to a net zero school, but the principal puts it best. All of the energy we, that's created, we use. And any leftover electricity gets sent back to the grid. Should have worn my sunglasses. Students, parents, and staff gathered on a hot morning with no breeze to officially open the school. We could have used that breeze. The wind turbines need at least 10 miles per hour to get going. And they didn't move an inch. The school has green written all over it. Even the teachers wore green. This is the wave of the future whenever it comes to building schools. From the solar panels to the cafeteria countertops. Made from glass, recycled glass. This school is a poster child for energy conservation. And someday your kids may come to this school on a future field trip. We have made the school accessible for student groups to visit from all over Irving and also outside the district to be able to see the great um, technology integration all through the campus. Technology that will help lower the cost of running the school. Officials say a typical middle school costs $250,000 a year to run. Lady Bird will only cost $65,000 a year. In Irving, Tommy Noel, The 33 News. Okay, we will open it up for questions. Uh, the, the first question we have is, uh, what was the most challenging task when building Lady Bird Johnson Middle School? Um, I would say the, the most challenging uh, was probably the funding, uh, because there was such a higher initial cost uh, for this type of building, and with budget issues and so forth, uh, it was very difficult to, uh, it wasn't real difficult, but it, it was fairly difficult to sell our school board on this concept, uh, mainly because of the money. But when they realized that the uh, abilities, uh, the various things that this would offer to the kids, uh, you know, they, they bought off on it. So I, I would say the most challenging task was, was the funding. The next question is who maintains the equipment necessary for the solar and wind, wind systems and our batteries needed and inverters? Uh, the maintenance, uh, we will do uh, with our own maintenance staff. Uh, of course, the first year, everything is, is under a one-year warranty, but uh, there was also training involved on, on being able to maintain the systems as well. Uh, the solar panels are very, very low maintenance. Uh, they just need to be hosed off once every uh, three or four months to get the dust off of them, and, and they should be good to go. Uh, however, just like any other uh, energy-using equipment, uh, we will utilize our staff to maintain it, and if that's not possible, uh, we'll contract out the work. We did not use batteries uh, on the system. Uh, the inverters actually work. Uh, they need AC power in order to operate, which uh, is unfortunate in that if we have a power failure on the site, our building won't be able to maintain power because the inverters have to be uh, powered up in order to convert the direct current coming from the solar panels into alternating current. 
So uh, batteries are not included, nor are they included on the side for storing uh, any of the power. All of the power goes back to the grid. Um, next question deals with uh, what are the possibilities of selling uh, kilowatt hours back to the grid or to using the energy at other venues? Uh, that's a great question. We, we do sell it back or at least receive a credit for what we send back on the grid and our electricity provider does provide power uh, for our entire district. So the contract we have with them is if we ever reach a point where we produce way more than what we will ever consume on that site, thus not being able to utilize the entire credit at that site, then they will allow us to uh, apply that credit to some of our other buildings in the district. Uh, the next question deals with the sundial. Uh, does the sundial take into consideration daylight savings time? Uh, it's kind of funny because it, it does not. Uh, when uh, the individual put the sundial in, uh, a sundial is pointed uh, what they call solar north and not true north. So daylight savings time, it's off an hour, and, but it's also off 20 minutes due to uh, it painting or facing solar north rather than true north. So uh, the person who actually placed the sundial uh, at the school has provided a small plaque explaining why there is a variation in times. How has the one-to-one -one laptop student ratio increased electricity usage? Was the school a one-to-one -one prior to becoming net zero? If not, were there projections made in the energy consumption model? Uh, okay, first, uh, as, in, in, as far as increasing electricity use, I don't think it's going to do that because the majority of the laptops, netbooks, and iPads are uh, all run on the wireless network, and the intent is to uh, charge those as little as possible. The kids do not charge them during class. Um, uh, a lot of the classes, the uh, computers, whatever type they are, they remain resident uh, within the room and they're recharged uh, at different times during the day on a cart. Um, we also designed, even though we have minimal electricity uh, capabilities within the classroom, the science labs were designed with multiple plugs in the event that kids uh, would someday carry their laptop they would be able to go to when they're in science class, they would be able to recharge at that point. Uh, the school was not one-to-one -one prior to becoming net zero. However, all three of our, all four of our high schools are a one-to-one -one model. Uh, the next question, have various schools taken field trips to the school to visit the node? Not yet. We've been open about a month, and uh, a lot of planning went in place. I didn't even get a chance to talk about uh, the curriculum. Uh, the, the curriculum was written around the renewable energies associated with the school. If you were to go to the school, you would see integrated within the, the math, social studies, science, and English curriculums different things involving renewable energy. It's not just limited to science and math. But we hope within a month um, the curriculum will be in place to where we can allow uh, other grade levels to come in. We're going to start with uh, second graders and fifth graders to come in. And because it's important not for them to just see the nodes, but to understand renewable energies. And obviously, because of the variation in uh, the age of the kids, you have to have different levels of curriculum. I can, uh, the next question, I can see that selling the additional money aspect to the school board would be an issue. Is there a backup energy system plan if the current system uh, goes down? Uh, there, there's actually capacity at the building for it to operate off of the electric grid. So in the event that we lost all of the solar for whatever reason, uh, we would have the ability to power this school. The next question, uh, were your wind and solar components made in America? Uh, 
I'm not sure on the wind. The solar components were made in America. Uh, the plant is out of uh, Arizona. Uh, I can give you more information on that uh, if you'd like to email me. Thank you for attending Sustainable Design of Learning Environment. ASEP would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Scott Lane, and our participants for joining our webinar today. Remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.